I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. Here's my coffee, and I'm your caffeine-imbued host today, pumpkin spice coffee, courtesy of Dunkin' Donuts. I love that stuff. Uh, and the Bible portion that we're going to be covering today is going to be Exodus chapter 18. Uh, Moses is beginning to put it all together, organize things. He gets some help from, from his father-in-law. And uh, it's a it's an interesting chapter. This chapter, there's some very good points in here. And one thought that I had not seen before. See, that's a cool thing about reading the Bible. Uh, no matter how many times you read it, it's not like a book you read it once and you put it away and don't read it again. Every time I read the Bible, I'm seeing something new in it. It's uh it's like it's a living document. Isn't that amazing? I know I'm not the only one who thinks that. So, without any further ado, uh, let's get started. Chapter 18. Now, Jethro, the priest of Midian, that's an important thing right there. Hang on to that thought. Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law, Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. And the other was named Eleazar, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. I'm thinking, when did Zipporah and her sons leave Moses? Maybe Moses sent his family home after their argument when Moses and his family were on their way to Egypt. Do you remember that whole thing where uh, Moses had not uh, circumcised his sons and God got angry and at a lodging place on the way in Exodus 4 it says the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him but Zipporah took a flint knife cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses feet with it surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me she said so the Lord let him alone at that time she said bridegroom of blood referring to circumcision so perhaps they had They'd been having an ongoing discussion about the circumcision thing. And his wife wasn't happy with it. But God was apparently going to force the issue. And it looks like Moses and Zipporah had an argument over all this. An ongoing discussion, perhaps, might be a better way of putting it. Those of you who are married know understand what I'm saying. Or maybe he sent them back after the initial exodus prior to the crossing of the Red Sea. I don't know. But it's, whatever the reason, he had sent them back home, maybe to get them out of danger uh, over the initial part of the journey because uh, the thing with Pharaoh wasn't done yet. Not sure. Uh, but anyway, he had sent them away. Jethro is sending them back. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. 
Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Now the generic name for God, Elohim, is used by Jethro here instead of the covenantal personal name Yahweh that Moses would refer to him as. Perhaps because God was relating to the Gentile and the Jewish world simultaneously. This is an important thought. You know, it, it's it's funny. I had always considered in the Old Testament that the Old Testament was a story of Israel, and it is, and that God dealt only with Israel and that it was until the time of Yeshua, Jesus, that Gentiles were brought in. But remember when I, we talked a little while ago and I said, there's that verse that says, Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, you know, and he's God. So you can say God the same yesterday, today, and forever. God was still dealing with Gentiles. And here is a man who was considered a Gentile who was not descended from Jacob, not descended from Isaac, not descended from Jacob. He is a descendant of another wife of Abraham that he took on after Sarah had died, Keturah. And she had a son, Midian, and he's of the line of Midian. But apparently, he believed in the God, same God that Moses did. Now, either he was a believer all along or Moses was involved in converting him during his 40 years of staying with him, marrying his daughter. Whatever the reason, however, however it came about, Jethro is a believer in the same God that Moses believed in. Uh, here's some other thoughts that I found in the commentary. The, the news evoked that Moses had just given Jethro an instant, an instinctive praise the Lord, thereby showing either that he continued believing in the God of his fathers or that he'd spiritually benefited from Moses' 40 year stay in his house. You know, I had a, an experience uh, when I became a Christian, and I immediately wrote to my aunt and to my uncle, my Aunt Mary Beth's uncle Fred strong Christians in the family, and I knew they were Christians. And I wrote them, and in my letter to them, I used God's name describing this thing or that thing. Uh, I can't remember the exact context of it. And my aunt wrote me back and said that she was very happy to hear me using God's name, but she wanted to make sure I wasn't using God's name in vain or being condescending. She wanted to know if I was truly a believer in God, and I told her I was, and we've been rejoicing with each other ever since. Uh, until God chose me and saved me, they were the sole representatives of God in my extended family. My mom and dad were wonderful, were wonderful people. I loved them. And they exhibited so many traits and, and characteristics of godly behavior in so many ways. But they weren't professing believers. I'm the first one of my generation. And so it was a little unusual. Mary Beth and Fred were not expecting that kind of stuff from me because I had acted in a very unchristian manner growing up. But it's but God was working in me. And and apparently God is working in Jethro because he has a commonality, he has a common point of interest with Moses, they worshiped the same God. And he was genuinely pleased at what God had done. See, Jethro was descended from the wife Abraham took after the death of Sarah, Keturah. And so he was outside the covenantal promise that came to Isaac and produced the nation of Israel, where Israel is going to be a chosen nation. But that doesn't mean that God hasn't chosen someone else too for another purpose. Jethro worships the same God, and he was very much a Gentile. And I think that's probably been the surprising element so far 
as I'm reading through the Old Testament this time, I'm seeing again and again and again where God is appealing to and working through people outside of Israel. Now, Israel is a chosen nation, and they're chosen for a purpose, but they weren't chosen to be the only people. Jesus even said, he said, I have to leave you now. I have, I have other sheep in other uh, I have other sheep in other flocks that I have to go tend to. But that wasn't a new thing. This wasn't a revolutionary thing that Gentiles could come into the fold now that Jesus had come. God was dealing with Gentiles, well, during Moses' time. You can see that here. There was a dis- from this point on, there's a distinction between the nation of Israel and the Gentile world. But that doesn't mean that God shut out Gentiles. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Anybody who seeks him will find him. Those that seek me will find me. That's what the, the psalmist says. Jesus even said, look, whosoever believes in me won't perish but have everlasting life. There, there is instance after instance after instance of God appealing to the Gentile world as well as Israel. Israel had a place and a purpose, and they were chosen to be a nation that would eventually bring forth Messiah. But that doesn't mean God wasn't working in people outside of Israel, and this is proof. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in in the presence of God. God accepted Jethro and accepted his sacrifices. That's liberating to me. You know, sometimes God will choose people that we just would not expect him to choose and to use. I have a friend of mine. He's a pastor. I'm not going to mention his name. But uh, he is a very unconventional man. He's had a very unconventional life that you would expect a pastor to have. Divorced on two occasions. And by his own admission, totally owns up to how he messed up. Totally owns up to how he did his best to destroy his life. And now God has brought him a wife that is perfectly suited for him. He's focused on what God has him to do. He knows why he's on this planet. And he's unconventional. His language is unconventional. His preaching is unconventional. His church that he pastors is unconventional. But he has fruit. He's reaching people that nobody else will reach. And I, and if, if I read him correctly, he's at peace with himself and with God for the first time ever in his life. So uh, you know, sometimes God selects people that are unconventional and outside the box, if you will. Jethro's outside the box. He's a priest of Midian. And yet, God is working through him, and he is a follower of Yahweh. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. And when his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge? Well, all these people stand around you from morning until evening. Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. Did you catch that? He's saying, look, you teach them how they are to live and how they are to behave. Because our actions mean something, don't they? 
But, he said, select capable men from the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, but, ah, that's an, another important point. This is another thing that is in Jethro's favor. He's giving him advice, but he says, all right, th- this is the best advice I got to give you, but you got to go to God with it and see if he agrees. If God agrees and commands it, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. You know, delegation is often so difficult for an able leader. Men were chosen here on moral rather than intellectual grounds to deal with simple matters. The way they lived their lives. These were men that were modeling the kind of life that Jethro was talking about. These are men who modeled a godly life, who you could look to as an example. It kind of reminds me of uh, when deacons were appointed in the first century church. Same kind of thing. Choose your deacons on moral grounds people who are full of the Spirit, who lived and pursued God, and they were to judge and to serve and to minister to people. There's no differences made between the sacred and the secular here. Whatever matter people had to bring, bring it before these men, and if the real difficult cases before Moses. There wasn't secular law and and, uh, religious law, sacred law. The entirety of law was God's gift. You know, it cracks me up when I hear people saying um, that they, when it comes to passing a legislation and laws here in the United States, that we need to work hard to separate a person's faith from his performance of his duties as a legislator. It, they they want us. It, it's like. They think that there's a law that there's law apart from morality, and they don't realize that the law of the land is that nation's morality. And I could no more separate my faith from the decisions I make than I could jump over the moon. Jethro is advising Moses: find men who reflect God's character, and let them judge all but the hardest of cases. And he says, you know, you, you point them, have one guy that's over thousands, and underneath him are gonna be people who are over hundreds, and the people who are over hundreds are gonna be people who are over fifties, and people who are over fifties will be over people who are tens. So you have a tiered judicial system, if you will, governed by men who are godly in their actions and their lifestyles. So Moses listened to his father-in-law, did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. Now, amazingly enough, Moses listened to his father-in-law. Moses was taught by a man who was not even an Israelite. And outside the Israel's covenant, the, prom- the covenantal people of Israel, but still a fellow believer in God, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, from which he was descended. He's a descendant of Abraham, just not through the child of promise, Isaac. He came through Midian, who was a son of Abraham's next uh, second wife, Keturah. So, He's outside the covenantal promise that God made with Israel, but that doesn't mean he's outside of relationship with God. God has a special covenant with Israel, a special purpose, but that isn't to make them a separatist and the only people he will deal with. God deals with anybody who seeks him. I used to know missionaries, and I knew one missionary who said he that uh, there were stories of missionaries coming to tribes and finding tribes worshiping God when nobody had been there to see them. 
God had manifested themselves and prepared these people for the missionaries to come and preach to them. And some of them were already converted and not a single missionary had been to see them yet. You see, there's a universal thing. Those that seek me early will find me. Whosoever will. If you are truly, truly seeking after God, God will be found. That's why uh, I challenge my unbelieving friends whenever the topic comes up. I said, look, I'm not going to try to convince you of God. You're going to believe him or you won't, in him or you won't. But I said, I will do this. If you are really seeking, if you are really, really seeking to change your life, my recommendation is, would be to ask God to show himself to you. He will show himself to you in a way that makes sense to you. He will touch your heart through whatever means he deems necessary to reach you. Being a musician, you know how he caught me, through music. It was under the ministry of a black full gospel choir that I was saved. The music was glorious. And as a musician, I was totally enthralled and blown away by the musicality of that service. And I had never heard anything like it. Music, the music hit my heart. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Because I'm a musician. God made me to be a musician. And music was the way he got to me. He has infinite number of ways to get to you. My challenge to my unbelieving Friends, and if there's any of you listening to this, is just simply do this. Ask God to show himself to you and then wait. If you are sincere in that request, I guarantee you God will show up in a way that will make incredible sense to you. Those that seek me early will find me. It's always been that way. The covenant promise with Israel purpose was not to make Israel a standalone, the only, the only people in the planet that are God's people. No. He had a plan for them and he chose them for a purpose. Yes, they are chosen by God in order to produce a nation that would produce a Messiah that would open the floodgates of God's grace to all who would ask. But here's the secret. That gate has always been open. Anybody who seeks him early will find him. And we're going to see that time and time again throughout the Old Testament. People outside the covenantal, covenantal promise meeting God, being adopted into God's family. Mm, good stuff, isn't it? All right. Well, that is enough for today, I think. Here's my coffee on page. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You know, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Come to think of it, my thoughts shouldn't be your thoughts. I'm glad that you're here listening with me as I think with my mouth open. But in the end, you have to think for yourself. <laughs>